Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome marketers, advertisers, and those who love them to Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, the decisions, and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former Chief Marketing Officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com here today with my guest, Gary Briggs. Today's topic, an experienced CMO and board member with technology chops dissects the CMO job. Gary started his career at Pepsi and McKinsey and went on to run marketing at PayPal, eBay, Motorola, and Facebook. He is currently on the boards of Etsy and Petco. Full disclosure, we work together at eBay. We teach several classes at CMO Bootcamp, and we are both CMO coaches. Welcome, Gary. It's great to see you. Hello, Mike Linton. This is going to be fun. Let's do it. It is going to be fun. So first question, you have been leading marketing orgs for a lot of years. <laughs> tell, us how, <laughs> tell us how the function has evolved since you started at, at Pepsi. Well, I think the biggest change has been the speed and availability of data. You know, when I started at Pepsi, I, it was really the thrust of it was creative and promotions. Not No real direct marketing per se in that particular brand. I mean, other brands at the time certainly had a lot of DM, but we, we did not. And and then the you know the internet era, which really started with the browser in 1994, more and more data started coming into um, and and going from what was just really kind of captive in the DM organizations to the whole marketing organization. And I think the acceleration of that through the you know the knots in the 2010s has been the biggest transformation and what's made a CMO go from having just creative chops and creative you know views idea, you know, generating ideas, filtering ideas to running lots of programs at a high rate of speed that are data driven to learn. Um, and I, I think that's the, you know, the math part of marketing, I think is the biggest change. Yeah, it was always big. And now it is super big, almost maybe yeah. sometimes, sometimes too big. And I like that you called them the knots. I've, I've never used the knots before, but I think I'm going to try and unplug that in the knots. So, so you know you 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 were one of the uh, it makes me I, sound British, I mean, it's yeah, certain, like, yeah. a cheerio and all that. So exactly, um, you know you were one of the early folks in tech, uh, um, where marketing is usually and sometimes sadly not really the center of the universe or not even near the center of the universe. Sometimes, yeah. Tell us about marketing and tech, and then then I want to tear that apart a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think I came to realization. Um, pretty early in it, which was the skepticism is is where the victory is, which is you you, you walk into an organization that's highly skeptical of marketing, um, particularly in you know Silicon Valley-ish companies uh, who model themselves after Apple and Google, thinking that neither of those companies do marketing when in fact they do a ton of it. Um, and so, you know, just as a full, as, as a foundational thing, that perception is wrong. I can come back to kind of talking about that. We are going to talk about that later. So yes, hold that yeah, thought. But, but I think the, the, the skepticism is, is really where the fun is. And, and I used to say to teams when I was at Facebook and, you know, we'd have the new class of folks starting not, not just marketing, but particularly the marketing org. And I would say, no one woke up this morning thanking, you know, God that marketing is here. And, and you should just know that, you know, when I was at Pepsi, it was much more of a marketing your your challenge is to win people over and and have them realize that uh, the value of marketing is high. And I, I'll give you an example, which is when I was at Google, uh, I worked on with with a bunch of great folks on the beginning of really the main campaign for Chrome, which was about 2010. We've got a big yeah. marketing push for Chrome, and I remember being backstage as we were about to announce this to the company with Sundar, who's, who's now the CEO. And yeah. Sundar looked at me and he said, "Do you think any of this is going to work?" And I said, I've done a lot of this. I think this is as good a chance as any. And it it did, you know, it was a great program, went, went really, really well. And Chrome started becoming the number one browser in the world. And every other PM in the company wanted now what Sundar had. Like, oh, you know, the, mar the marketing. 
once once you kind of unlock it and people see what it could do, everybody wanted it. So it, it is those those victories out of the skepticism is is where the, the energy is. The, but the you just gotta know part, it's there. Yeah. Uh, well, this is very similar to my experience at Best Buy where I put up one marketer in one merchant category and then all the merchants funded the rest of all my marketing. Right. But, right. but there's there's this challenge. I love the skepticism is is where the victory is, but the skepticism is also where the disappointment can sometimes be where you just can't get through. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. And then that and like how do you get a space where you have a chance to win over the skeptics versus you're never gonna cross the Rubicon and and actually get anybody yeah. to 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 let you do something. Well, one one is I think you you have to call it out for what it is, like pretending it's not there. I've seen that you know approach before, of, and and you you really have to throw away any of the arrogance of of that marketers can have. It's just like that isn't going to work for you at all. I, you you and I have certainly seen that type over. You mean over like the, the marketers from Pepsi and Procter. <laughs> Uh, sorry, <laughs> not to not to paint with a broad brush, but you know, um, and and so letting people know that you you know that you see that, and and letting your organization know that you know that and see that is a, is an important start. I used to say, hey, look, I know I real uh, realize I walk around with a post it note on my forehead that says ad guy, you know, yeah. marketing more advertising. <laughs> I'm going to show you why, and I think in particularly in tech companies. It is in product marketing where the the that you really focus. You know that there's a, a guy who, who just recently, I think he just retired from Google, a guy named Andy Burnt, who who ran, ran oh, their yeah. Inter- yeah, and ran their internal creative agency called Creative Lab. Really talented guy. And one of my first meetings at Google, he said about product marketing. He said that the and I think it's such a great summation. He said, "Know the user, know the magic, connect the two. And, and the user is, again, you, you have to kind of be the representation of the user of the person who's using the product. But the magic is is the product. And, and you as a brand person, you as a marketing person, need to know the product as well as the product manager does, as well as the engineers know it. Not that you need to code, but you need to understand what is in there and how do you unlock it. And I think one of the things I certainly saw both at Google and at Facebook, and I didn't really appreciate it as much when you and I were together at eBay, is it, it is in the product marketing where the unlock happens. And, and if, if you can can really start to explain to users you know, how the product works, break down into really small pieces of content and explain how to drive retention and depth of use and repeat, et cetera, all of that is, is in the product marketing. And then that opens up the world of marketing to the organization. Super helpful. Let's let's flip this over to measures now because one of the things you see a lot of marketers struggle with is they have certain measures, you know, they, they have the big brand measures and then they have CAC and and and, and all the other measures of, of of performance marketing. Some of those measures people care about, but a lot of those measures they don't, particularly in tech. What what measures were the best for you? What would you tell our listeners to think about when they're when they're talking about measures, particularly like in general, then also in tech in particular? Yeah. I mean, first of all, if 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 what you're measuring is uh are are things that just marketing cares about, they're the wrong measures. You know, so so first of all, I think, and I've seen some of your other broadcasts which are great around particularly how to think about uh, your, your relationship with the CFO, which we can talk about too, what you have a podcast on that, but making sure you're working with the CFO and, and the, you know, the founder or the CEO on what measures matter, uh, is, is important. I, I, I did that when I first, um, got to Facebook in particular and broke it down into really three components. There were three things that we really cared about. There, there was the product marketing, as I mentioned just a moment ago, there was the corporate marketing and then there was a whole arena around innovation and 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 really driving momentum, which I think is a very important thing that marketers don't talk a lot about. But momentum is a huge lever, particularly in technology, is demonstrating momentum. But in the in the product marketing area, what we talked a lot about was trust, and we did see a uh, relationship, a correlation, not necessarily a causation, but certainly a correlation between. Uh, a measure of trust, and I can get into what it was specifically called, but basically it was a, it was a, a derivation of, of the idea of trust 
in and also uh what was called time well spent now there's you know literally minutes or you know that people spend yeah. in the facebook app the instagram app whatever but it, it's also people's perception of it was time well spent not just time spent those were two of the measures we looked a lot at which were um driving time spent usage of the product and satisfaction with the product and then there were things that were happening in the corporate brand that we also looked at which is essentially do people want Facebook to be successful or not? There's obviously, you know, a lot of stories there in terms of my time at, at Facebook, but do people want Facebook to be successful? How do people view Mark? Um, how do people, when, when Cheryl was the CEO, Cheryl Sandberg was CEO, how do people view Cheryl? Um, it is, is Facebook uh, good for the world or not? As, as Those are all things that we, from a corporate messaging and communication standpoint, we were very interested in. In. And then the momentum one is um, a, a kind of a sim simplification of it. We had a couple of measures we looked there, which is, is the company's best days ahead or behind? And and we looked at that as uh, amongst not only Facebook, but other peer companies to get a general sense of momentum in the market, which has a you know impact in everything from developer relationships to to the stock price, you know, in terms of uh, how investors view it. So those those are how we kind of broke down the components. The one we spent the most time on was trust, and and yeah. you know there, there's there's obviously a lot of stories about that as it relates to the arc of time. I was at Facebook, which was from 13 to 18. Yes, yeah, so let's go into that now because it I can't keep my hands off of Cambridge Analytica because you were there during Cambridge Analytica. I was, so, yeah. I, yeah, like it just feels like such a great segue off the trust comment and the momentum. Yeah. What like tell us about it, and then what marketing and public relations and comms lessons came out of that 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 you can share with us? Yeah, so so um, I had resigned in January of eighteen because uh, I wanted to go work in in politics, uh, which we can talk about too. But I wanted to go work in politics in the twenty twenty cycle, and Cambridge Analytica broke in March, so two months later. Uh, while I was uh, still in the, in the seat. Um, as an aside, and my wife, Catherine, and I joke about this a lot um, to find some humor in it, which was, I remember that weekend, the, it broke on a Friday, the story. We kind of saw it coming on a, on a Tuesday. Story broke on a Friday in The Guardian and The New York Times. And I was doing talk to text saying Cambridge Analytica, and the response came back in the text was Cambridge and a liquor store, which I've always felt was <laughs> probably a good summation of what, what happened. Um, the biggest thing of, of learning was, um, we responded too slowly. There was a debate, uh, at the top of the company of how fast to get Mark out there talking. And the practical issue we had, which was, I, you know, I'd say in hindsight overthought was we didn't know what truth was because we didn't yeah. actually know if Cambridge Analytica had the data they were saying they had or not. There was a lot of BS about what Cambridge Analytica was saying, how good their actual uh, analytics package really was. There's a lot of exaggerative things they were saying. It all didn't matter. It was a real a piercing of trust in, in Facebook. And it's an interesting through line because you know, we had made a lot of progress on improving trust in Facebook from really kind of just before I got there, but certainly through the time I was there up until Cambridge Analytica. And, and we lost, as a, as a trust measure we were tracking, we lost about four years of gains in about six weeks. And, and actually you can probably say in the first two weeks. And the reason was preceding that there were a couple of blowups that had happened. One that was you know called Russian ads, where there was, there was the uh, Russian organizations were buying ads on Facebook, not in rubles, as, as one senator said at one point, but in, in dollars. Uh, and they were they were buying ads. Um, and consumers essentially said, well, that that I don't I don't like that, but that didn't really impact me. I wouldn't have been duped by that. The difference in Cambridge Analytica was if I had taken the personality quiz that was the kind of foundation of their data set, not only was my data pulled in but you as my friend, your data was pulled in too. And so you were really pissed off. And, and that's this it's called Friends of Friends, which is the, the kind of uh, corpus that was there. That really pissed people off to the point where they're like, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't take that personally. It's how dare you? And, and that 
was massively injurious to the to the company. Um, you know, even above and beyond the, the corporate brand is people really started to use the product differently and less uh, because they were so so upset by, by what happened. And it we didn't to, to kind of complete the point and then we didn't get Mark, I think he didn't go on CNN until Wednesday. Yeah. And um and and the fact that you know we lost that weekend and then the early part of the week was was really put us on our heels and we just should have yeah, got it. I will say personally, for me, I was at Farmers then, and I had used a group called the Cambridge Group to do my segmentation. And well, I use I use Cambridge Group. I use Cambridge Group at Facebook and at Google. So I yeah, Jason I, Green, and I, I immediately put out a note to everybody on the senior lead team and the board and said, "This is not Cambridge Analytica. They're not associated. This is the Cambridge <laughs> Group. They're doing a different thing." Because I knew I, I already got incoming the second it was in the news. Yeah, yeah. And so well, Cambridge, I, was... I mean, if, if if Jason happens to watch this, first of all, hi. He's he, Jason, I don't know if you maybe know this. We're, he's one of my best friends. We used to be roommates and after grad school. Um, but but he and I are very, very good friends. And um, yes, that is not the same organization. Yeah, it's not the same group. I'm gonna send this to him when, when the show breaks. <laughs> um so wait, let's go on to so this cost you four years of trust, which is an amazing amount of of, of loss. Yeah. And now you have this whole privacy thing just hanging over you, which is, yeah. you know, and you've watched a bunch of brands try and sell privacy or not sell privacy. You know, it's a big component of, of Apple, but maybe no one else has really made it work that well. T tell me, like, let's let's go off of the, the Cambridge Analytica thing and talk about your experience with privacy and consumers. And what can you tell marketers about trying to make this a point or not? Well, let me go. Let me take a broad point, and then and then your that question. First of all, I think every company needs to have a playbook behind glass of what they do when they have a data breach. Now, yeah. there's all sorts of things that are now required and should be from the FTC around uh, notification to consumers about the breach. But the biggest issue you have is who gets to make the decision and how fast you're going to make it, because what it become it became a bit of kindergarten soccer very quickly, which was not helpful. Like a Everyone's lot of chasing the ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just not, not great. So that's, that's first. Then around privacy, you know, there, there are actually a, a lot of consumers who don't really care a lot about privacy. They, they, they see the use of a free product in a very rational sense of like, I'm getting benefit from this. I know I'm giving up some data to do that. I'm totally fine with it, but that's a, that's a trade-off I'm willing to, you know, something right. along the order of my life's not particularly interesting anyway. So if you want to know what I'm searching, have at it. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of consumers who care a lot about it. And, and, um, and, and that you can break down into different segments. It does tend to be older consumers on, on balance. Not saying that there aren't young consumers who care a lot about privacy. There are. But if you take kind of the, the demos across them, it, it tends to be older, older consumers. Uh, you know, less, as they kind of say, less digitally native. Certainly governments and media institutions care a lot about it and uh, and write a lot about it. Um, and and then what we found in particular is, you know, Cambridge Analytica is, is really becomes the proof point is no, no surprises. Right. So so if if you are forthright about what you're doing and people have a sense of how their information is being used, then they're good with it. So one of the things we did when I was early there, we did a thing called privacy checkup. And, and you, people may remember this. It had a little blue dinosaur that, that kind of took you through a, a setting. It's not just privacy like a dinosaur. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Why was a blue dinosaur? That's a whole separate story. But, uh, um, you know, these things show up sometimes and you, you can't kill them off unless unless uh, they're dinosaurs, in which case they get killed off. But anyway, um, yeah, no, it, it – you – taking people through their individual settings and having people know that they're making explicit choices and they understand how the product works really kind of fundamental going back to this point of product marketing works really well. So as an example, one of the things we did in Facebook is if you went to go block a user, for example, it did trigger a, a privacy checkup module being sent to you to say, Hey, you know, we see that you've used this. You might want to check these other things too to make sure you're getting the experience that you want. 
And those types of communications are extremely helpful to, to, to really user by user by user driving privacy up. I think I, I summarize this. I, well, at least this is my view. And what I hear you saying is privacy is what you do, not what you say. And yeah, and, and actually certainly has to start there. Yeah. Yeah. And saying it also doesn't actually maybe do that much for you. It's like, remember when Uber was on their safety thing and they're, they say, now we're safer. I think there's a whole bunch of people out there going, wait, you weren't safe all the time. Right. I mean, I, I think this is a really two edged sword where you have to, you have to really think through, gosh, you know, you, you ought to have really good privacy rules, procedures, and then for people that want to dig in, they ought to be able to dig in and find it. But talking about it may or may not help you. Thoughts? That, on yeah, that? yeah, yeah. And but there's but people leave lots of breadcrumbs in their user experience about how they're thinking about privacy and how to kind of meet them where they are with you know pieces of content that help them understand how to use the product better. Uh, I, I think that's uh, you know in software in particular that that's something you can you can uh, work against. Got it. Let's let's flip over and go back to a comment you made earlier, which is, you know, a whole lot of times, particularly in tech, but in a lot of companies, you'll get the CEO, the board or the CFO saying, look, Google and Facebook don't really do any marketing or, you know, they, you know, they don't have any of this brand stuff. Let's follow their lead. Let's structure like them. Let's do everything they do. Um Tell us about that argument and how people should think about it. So um, I'll leave my, uh, you know, send, send a note to the email you'll see below. Uh, and it's, I mean, that assertion is completely BS in, in that, um, you know, Apple, as an example, Apple does a lot of market research. Apple does a lot of product marketing. Some of the most, you know, influential people inside uh, Apple are product marketers, uh, yeah. product managers in their case. Um Google certainly, you know, one of the bigger marketing budgets I ever worked with was was at Google. Got much bigger during the you know the 2010s, really starting with the Chrome campaign. Yeah. Um, just because it's a dated number, I, I remember going in to go see the woman who was running Ops, which basically strategy uh, head yeah. of strategy at the time. When I just started, and, and before she even says hello to me, she says, "So you're the guy who's supposed to spend 300 million dollars well on Chrome." That was the first thing she said to me when I walked in. So you know, there's a, that's a sizable budget on, on a, uh, an ad campaign for for that brand at the time. So a lot of money, a lot of people. There is a lot of marketing going on at, at these companies, and uh, as they should. I mean, you know, in the case of of Facebook, Facebook's now reaching over three billion people a day. So right. that's a lot. That's a lot of communication that needs to go on. Well, well, the other thing I think where this argument is total bullshit, as you said, which is is. The other thing, Facebook and Google are getting all their money from marketers because they're a platform for marketers to market. And and yeah, they're, they're yeah. actually their product in use is the marketing. And, Absolutely. and the, the idea that you can duplicate that if you don't have that platform is yeah. it's just like crazy. Yeah, we'll do fertilizer. Yeah, this is this way. is the thing that that you know boggles my mind about what Elon's doing with with Twitter and X. When I was hired at Facebook in 13, Cheryl Sandbrook, Cheryl used to say to in introducing me, the reason I got hired was because of advertisers. Advertisers were saying to her and Mark, we're not going to scale our advertising with Facebook if Facebook isn't trusted. It's, you know, adjacency, which is the, the classic right. media right. question. Right? Real, real. So, so I was hired to, you know, this gets back to this Kim Jalilka story in that arc, but I was hired to improve the trust in Facebook. Because you know they wanted to improve the environment for advertisers to advertise, yeah. And and the thing that that particularly is the engine for Google and Facebook is the mid market. It's it's not the hundred largest advertisers. It's the middle market, and and them understanding how the product works, them understanding how to ramp up their own advertising capabilities, uh, knowing that they're going to reach people the way they want to reach them is is hugely powerful in those markets. And for companies like Twitter, which is very reliant on top 100 advertisers, not having a trusted environment, not having a safe environment for advertisers is ruinous. Um, and and that does, you're exactly right, Mike. That's a, a core principle of how these these companies operate. Well, and, and, and this idea that you can model against a company that is effectively a media delivery platform 
with just because you like what they're doing or, or it's, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it just doesn't make any, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And I think it goes back to the beginning of your questions, which is, you know, one of the roles you have to play as the head of marketing is, is one, you've got to learn the other functions, you know, particularly the finance function, but you yeah. also have to be the one who's educating through the company of what the role marketing can, can play. Um, and, and that, that's a huge part of it, particularly when you're a CMO. Hey, I, I, there's, a, there's about five or six things I want to drill down on. We're going to have to have you back on the show, but yeah. I, I want to go, if you will come back. So yeah. I, I'm looking for that public commitment. So thank you. <laughs> um, I, the, um, so, you know, we had Bill Cobb on the show and, uh, who, who supervised both of us in his career and, and lived to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, who said there's life after getting fired. I, I yeah. you know, we both lived through that. Tell us, yeah. tell us, tell the marketers out there or the folks in, in the fastest turning jobs, you know, kind of how to think about this. Yeah, first of all, just a shout out to Bill, because Bill Bill and a guy named Brian Sweetie are who I worked for when I was a puppy at Pepsi, which is why I ended up, my family, we all moved to the West Coast to join eBay in, in 02, was because of Bill and Brian. Um, look, I mean, I, I think you're... It's interesting when you look at, at your background on LinkedIn or my background on LinkedIn, everyone thinks, you know, it's up and to the right. You know, it's like, that's what, that's what it's been. They don't see the Grand Canyons in the middle. Yeah, they don't. And, and a huge part of your career is resiliency and recovering from failure. And that is not written about or talked about very much. Um, you know, when you and I were together at eBay, for example, you know, Meg Whitman had been the CEO uh, I had a whole set of experiences there and different jobs I had there, but I was sitting in the seat as CMO of North America in kind of, you know, 2006 to 2008. And Meg had made the call that she was going to leave and there was a new CEO coming in. And it was pretty clear to me that new CEO was going to want somebody else to run marketing than me. I mean, I just kind of saw that happening from, from a mile away. And I remember finishing up a we had this thing called ebay main street where we'd go and, and have you know what is now pretty common but a zoom essentially with uh with sellers and we're standing in the parking lot now i've been now there for about six and a half years and um the guy says to me he's one of the two people who's likely going to be the ceo and he says i just come back from a, from a month and a half off which was very generous you got a sabbatical after five years and I was trying to make a decision of whether to leave or take a leave of absence because I wanted to spend some time with with our boys, twin boys, uh, my wife. And and so um, he says to me, well, you know, Gary, what are you thinking? Are you going to leave or or take a leave of absence? And I said, well, look, a lot of it has to do with you. Do you, do you, you know, what are you thinking? And and he says to me, well, you know, if you're going to stay, you really need to be open to what job you're going to have. And I said, well, it sounds like you've made a decision, so I'll leave. And, and that's the way it went down. I mean, it was, it was, you know, that uh, surgical really. And, and that's the other thing too, is a lot of times it doesn't, you know, first of all, there's a lot I needed to learn from that experience for sure. Yeah. But sometimes it's necessarily just you. Like it, it, it is the circumstance of a new regime coming in or a change in strategy. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, you need to be responsible to to get yourself connected with people who do what you do uh, above and beyond the company you're in. Like I, I have always spent a lot of time with people outside where I worked, yeah. not just, not socially, but professionally. And I, it's not like I went to conferences very much. I didn't go to do a lot of that stuff. I didn't really like that. I met with people. Like I would go talk to people. I'd go, you know, meet with you or go, go talk to other people and get, get to know them just so that I understand how to do my job well. And also, as it turned out, you know, these were the personal connections who helped me through the trough. So you're going to have them. I mean, it it, it is not. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you're going to have them. And that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, um, it actually was one of the best things that ever happened was to take that time off and then, and then, and then go do something else. Okay. So we're, we're going to drill down on the, a bunch of uh, like what I learned. Well, we're, we're going to have you back on the show and drill down a bunch of stuff, but I've, I have two last, Last question for this show. You can take them in order or any order you want. First, okay. the, the funniest story you can share on the air 
And the second is practical advice for our listeners. And, and before, I, I just want to finish on the, the eBay CMO. Sorry, that was a tough structured job in a tough place. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was not the kind of job, it was not a very easy job to succeed in for anybody. Yeah, I guess we, we, yeah. we buried an important fact, which is the person who had the job right after I left it was you. So uh, Yes, and, and, and it was not a job that I wished for when I, I know you. And I talked about it. I, I didn't I want it. So yeah, yeah it was it, as you are saying, the winds of the the winds of the CMO job are very, very unclear where they're gonna come from and, and Absolutely. get you because yeah, I, I didn't want any of that. Yeah. So so funniest story and then piece of practical advice you can share on the air. You can take one or both of them, but you have to take at least one. I'll take the f- funny story just because I think it's insightful. It's kind of a wonderful story. So, so, and it's about Mark Zuckerberg. So, so, and, and uh, I think he, he would be fine with me telling this story. When, when I was at Facebook, we used to go once a year and go meet with another company and do kind of a top to top. Uh, and we, it was really extraordinary. I mean, what Samsung and Walmart and Proctor, but one year we went to Quantico to do a top to top with the Marine Corps. And uh, and we were there for maybe about an hour and a half. None, none of us knew this except for Mark and Cheryl knew this. They, we get to about six o'clock, two drill sergeants come next to the commander and take us through what is going to be a first night of being in the Marines. Like they start screaming at us. We go through the whole thing, like making your bunk as if we are Marines, not knowing what the heck's going on. And everyone, you know, I remember traipsing around through the with my my bag and David Ebersman, who was the CFO, is rollerboard. It's like we are marching around going into the <laughs> barracks. And we go through the next uh two and a half, three hours making bunks, taking a shower, you know, men on one side of the barracks, women on the other. Um, and they one of the people they are screaming at a lot is Mark, because he happens to be wearing glasses at the time. He's contacts and was wearing his glasses at night. And he kept scratching himself and the 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 sergeant would come up into his face and scream at him like what are you you know doing it was it was it was like full metal jacket without um vincent d'onofrio and um (laughs) and we get done uh at about 10 30 and we're now having pizza in the middle of the barracks and sergeant cheatham who was the lead sergeant steve uh comes up to me and he says i didn't know who he was (laughs) and i said really that's awesome. And I said, <laughs> I said, can we go uh, tell Mark? And he said, yeah. So I got to Mark and I said, hey, man, um, he didn't know who you were. Uh, and he says, oh, really? I thought so, because no one's yelled at me like that since I was 19. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, oh, go ahead. No, that's the that's that's just I have a couple like that, but it's so an insight into you know, that world. It's just a crazy, crazy world. All right. Well, I think that is a great way to end the show. Thank you, Gary. We'll definitely have you back. And thanks to everyone for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for more of our shows on Evergreen, Apple, Spotify, and YouTube, which include a report from the front lines of artificial intelligence. What your agency wants to tell you, but won't parts one, two, three, and four. Why every marketer should learn finance and why the short shelf life of CMOs parts one and two. Hey, all you marketers, be safe out there. This is Mike Clinton signing off for CMO Confidential. Today's episode of CMO Confidential is brought to you by CMOcoaches.com. Are you a current or aspiring chief marketing officer looking to take your career to the next level? You should work with a CMO coach. CMO coaches are former CMOs who are nationally certified coaches. So whether you want to improve your leadership skills, develop your team, or drive better business results, we have the experience and expertise to help you succeed. To learn more, visit us at cmocoaches.com.